Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Matt Harrington with the Southwestern Vermont Chamber of Commerce, and we have partnered again with uh, our team down at Cat TV Studios on Main Street in Bennington, Vermont, to broadcast a special telecast uh, around COVID-19. Um, you might have tuned in a couple of weeks ago when we got an update from Dr. Trey Dobson and Tom D from the hospital. Uh, and we wanted to quickly follow that telecast uh, with uh, uh, another partner of ours, United Counseling Services. And so uh, as we head into uh, the third surge of COVID here in 2020, and as we uh, get ready for a new year, we know that uh, the, the weather has changed, uh, especially in Vermont, and so that requires uh, some more strict um, considerations as we deal with the virus and uh, more further lockdown and getting back into uh, kind of how we entered uh, this COVID pandemic, which can cause stress, it can cause depression, uh, and at maybe the very least, uh, anxiety for a lot of people, not just business owners, but the community at large. And so with that in mind, we want to invite back Dr. Reeve, along with Lori Vatican, to uh, from UCS to give us, you know, give give us a pep talk. Uh, let us know, you know where we've been so far. What's the journey we're on? How do we prepare maybe for a longer winter than we hope? Um, but hope is on the horizon as a vaccine is being made, and uh, and it won't be too long. So with that being said, I just want to introduce Dr. Reeve. And Lori, any, any beginning thoughts as we kind of, you know, we, we've had Dr. Reeve on in March. We had her again back on in July. And yet here we are again <laughs> talking about COVID. What's new? Well, I can't really say anything differently than what Trey Dobson and Tom D already said, which is COVID is here. And we're seeing an increase around the state. Luckily, we're not seeing an astronomical increase in Bennington County. But uh, one of the data points that came out this past week is that the rate of doubling in the state is now uh, every nine days. So that represents a really significant increased rate of infection going from different people to each other. And um, our job to try not to convey it to other people is increased. So Governor Scott has looked at that data, has responded to the influence of concerns for keeping people safe, and has looked at what can we do and put in measures that will decrease the likelihood of us having uncontrolled contact. So one of the things, as the newspaper pointed out this morning, um, when you drink and take off your masks, you tend to get a little disinhibited. It's wonderful to have conversations and you go up and you slap somebody on the shoulder or you give them a hug or you high five. Well, unless you're an orangutan, when you're high fiving and slapping each other on the shoulders, you are not six feet apart. Yeah. And so we by nature come in closer contact. And so it's what I also appreciate about the governor and the entire um, State Department of Health is they are not playing the blame game. And that's very, very important, is not to blame people who get sick, who inadvertently get other people sick. Um, we don't have anybody trying to make people sick and we wanna keep it that way. But Donna Barron wrote a lovely um, article in today's Bennington Bar Banner about how you could be a typhoid Mary, um, which was back in typhoid times and, and conveying, she went and worked in different people's kitchens and she was a carrier. She was an asymptomatic carrier of a very confectious contagious disease. So similarly, we can all become the um, COVID Cathy's, if you will, or the COVID Charlie's and convey it to everybody around us. So far, we don't have those kinds of people, but that's where wearing a mask decreases the likelihood of giving it to somebody else. It decreases the likelihood of somebody else giving it to me. So it's a two-way street. 
Now that doesn't tell you exactly where we are, but it, uh, it sets the stage of a, a few things that I think Lori and I are gonna be talking about, mm -hmm. about people's psychological responses to that reality. Lori. Yeah. Lori, give us a little bit of your background too. Um, you know, we, we've had Dr. Rivon before, we haven't had you on. So for our audience, just give a little bit of a, a quick bio. Absolutely. So again, my name is Lori Vatican, and I'm the clinical director of United Counseling Services. I also am the director of CRT, Substance Use Services, and one of our group homes. Um, I have to say, I have been super impressed and amazed with our staff. Uh, the numbers are higher than we've ever had. And yet, I see such hope and optimism. And I think that, you know, when in Italy or, or I was thinking about the foot, you know, uh, the rooftops in Madrid, like people communicating through, through like banging and letting others know that it's, it's going to be okay. We're going to get through this together. And it is, it's a dark time, but there is a lot of beautiful, hopeful things that you can do for yourself that you can remember. Uh, you know, we all can join together and being safe, but at the same time, finding these different strategies for us to stay connected. And so, you know, Dr. Reeve and I work together um, and I feel close to her, but clearly we're at different ends of the hall and we stay put. Uh, we wear our masks and, and when we pass each other in the hallway, um, you know, there's always a fun greeting, but we we remember that we ha it's a different time. We have to be safe in, yes. in how we do things. So, that's who I am. That's I, that my message is going to be one of hope today. I will let you know. That's kind of where I sit and how I uh, right. am feeling that. about things. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to get right into into that, Lori. Um, you know, how has stress and anxiety increased since March? You know, I think we could have probably taken a, a, a pulse and a, and a snapshot if we had in March, in July, and now heading into December. Where are we at in terms of maybe a spectrum or a barometer or a pressure gauge? And this is a question for both of you uh, in terms of just even uh, people walking into UCS and using a lot of UCS's services. Are we seeing an increase? Yeah. Yes. So there's a critical need right now. And what I think is wonderful are people are reaching out. Our numbers for intake are higher than they've ever been. So people are feeling stressed. They're fearful. They're anxious. They're feeling fatigued. You know, they, uh, they feel despair. Um, you know, they're almost paralyzed. The ones that are watching too much media are most paralyzed with fear. Uh, and it's confusing. You know, sometimes they report they're not knowing what they're feeling. Um, this is just such an unusual time in our lives. And so it is true, the numbers are higher, um, but we are responding with telehealth, um, beautiful opportunities that we've been able to give telehealth equipment for people that didn't have that so they can stay connected. Alia, I don't know, what are what would you add to that increased need? Well, I think there are, our chief of operations has been keeping track of the number of people requesting services by phone or in person. And we are now getting on a weekly basis what used to be our monthly or higher than our monthly referral rate back a year ago. So we're getting somewhere between 40 to 45, sometimes even a high of 47 calls a week, um, which is quite substantial. And that's across the age span. Um, and most people are coming in for at least the beginning part of treatment. Some don't need to keep on going. And one of the things that we are doing because of that is making sure no one's turned away, making sure that if our services are not what is needed, that we are referring them to, to the correct place. Um, the other thing I want to point out in you know, today's banner, they continue to do a really good job of supporting our community in terms of information is that turning point and the peer connection for substance abuse and, and getting into recovery has been playing, continue to play a very strong role in town and in our county. What they really want and need to do is get into all of the towns of our county. Um, and that's just a slow logistical 
<laughs> challenge that needs to be met. And it's very exciting that they got a, a small grant that will be allowing them to go out on calls with emergency services and the police starting in the new year. That's the kind of co-location of services at the front lines that meets people in the community where they need it. Yeah. And it's really good to come to UCS and have a group or talk about your fears. It's not enough. Um, we have been monitoring how many of our emergency calls come in. And so in July, we had 355 phone calls and in-person assessments. In August, it went up even further, 442. In September, it was 385. In October, it was 341. So these are people outside, individual calls. It's not the number of repeat callers. It's and let's talk about that client. You know, uh, I'm, I, w- I want to hear from both of you, but what are some of the myths of, of the clientele of UCS? You know, is it, you know, it. it First off, there's a very everybody? broad clientele. Yeah. Um, so there's huge responses and you get the range of anxiety responses go from paralyzing fear that Lori was talking about to anger and denial. So you get people who don't want to wear masks and who are simply angry that the COVID pandemic is still happening and that their um, flexibility and mobility is, is being curtailed or contained, who want to have five different generations of their family together for Thanksgiving. And by gum, they're going to do it because they've always done it. <laughs> and that's actually when you dig a little, yeah. I have not yet met anybody who would do that if they thought or in any way understood that it put their family members at risk. It almost always is a response to feeling overwhelmed that they wanna pretend that it's not a dangerous time. So it's kind of like the kid who didn't understand the blackout during the blitz in England and wanted to light a light or a candle or a flashlight. And you know, it's that, but I need, I want this. Yes, but it's the collective need that we have to pay attention to. As Governor Scott said, it, um, it's not a language I'm used to, but it is a patriotic response to think about the collective whole instead yes. of the individual well-being. Yeah, um, and, and we talked a little bit about that one of the other times, whether I, you know, I think it was around the Kubler-Ross change uh, model uh, and be hitting that kind of dip or, even, at once. <laughs> or the loss cycle. I mean, that's what we're talking, the loss of, of something we had or the loss of something we never had, you know? So it's interesting. What that, we anticipate. Right. What we anticipate. So really uh, for many of those people out there, you know, what I'm hearing from, from both of you is, you know, a lot of empathy, you know, kind of understanding. Yeah. We all want to get with our family. Yes. We all want that. Um, Lori, did you have something to add? Well, I just, I love where, where you're going with this. I, I just think we have to acknowledge and validate everyone. Everyone does have a different way of grieving or responding to this. And if we can just meet people where they are, um, and it's that validation, you know, earlier today, Dr. Reed was talking about um, no blame. And I think that um, the tendency is there. So for us to just um, meet people, attune to them, let them know, you know, that you hear them and there's ways that you can be together that can be equally fun. You know, uh, having a virtual Thanksgiving dinner can be very playful. You can add some games in there. Um, you know, everybody can have, you know, sometimes at family uh, gatherings, there's always one person that gets to be the one talking and maybe it's going to be different virtually. Maybe everyone's going to get some time to be, uh, have some air time. So things can look different. They, it can be good. Um, and so I feel, again, I'm going to come in with the optimism and the hope. This is a different time, but it's okay. It is true that we're going to do things differently and that will be, that'll be okay. I want to take a, a quick, quick, um, maybe pivot, but not completely, but I just want to uh, talk a little bit about the, the full range of services that UCS offers. Um, you know, as, as, as we have people watching this, um, what are a lot of, if you had to put it in the buckets or, or there was a, a list of items, 
Um, what, what does UCS do? What does United Counseling Services do within Bennington County? Oh, golly, we have so many programs. I know, it's a, it's a it, we could go down. Okay, so we offer adult and childhood services. We offer therapeutic services. We offer crisis stabilization and crisis evaluations in a broad nutshell. For complex people, we also back up with psychiatric evaluations and medication access and diagnostic evaluation. There's group and individuals. There are peer uh, groups and peer activities. So both, for example, there's a teens uh, for change and a chickens for change and adult peer groups. So there's a wide range. Some of it is focused by gender, male groups, female groups. Some of it's focused by disorder, like anxiety or hearing voices. Some of it is focused by certain disorders like substance use and um, complicated multiple drug use and needing group therapy. We even now have an intensive outpatient program going that Lori is heading up. So th there's a huge range, but one of the things I said back in the spring is anxiety is normal and our collective community has been traumatized by the risk of something we can't see and enemy, if you will, that is invisible and attacks us unwittingly. And so it's very hard to sustain that and not feel traumatized. And so in that sense, in addition to the prevalence of emotional and physical and sexual abuse in the community, of which we have a fair amount, and sadly we get to get a pulse on that, there is the collective trauma of an unknown enemy attacking us at an unknown, unpredictable time and everybody being slightly on edge. So what people now call it is not is, is descriptive, but not necessarily helpful is COVID fatigue. Mm. Like, don't talk to me more about that. Don't give me another restriction. Don't da, 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 da. like, if you say no, it won't happen. Like, you know, when your kid yells and you yell back, don't yell. Uh, that doesn't really work, does it? No, because all you want to do is yell louder. Um, so, and we can all kind of get more and more oppressed by talking a lot about how tired we are. It's useful to acknowledge it, but it's always helpful to find a way through it. What Lori does so well and why she talks about hope is always looking at let's not get stuck in this mud of feeling tired. Yeah. Let's keep moving. And, and so I, yeah, I'm going to piggyback off that. And I, I think that we offer United Counseling offers everything from prevention all the way to recovery. And we do that in a variety of ways. What do you need? We're going to make your treatment individual to you. Do you need family treatment? Do you need couples counseling individual? Um, do you need an intensive group? Do you need a, a bunch of different groups. We have peer groups so that there's not a facilitator, uh, you know, a clinical person in the room. It's, it's your peers. So we do have a host of, of things that we offer. You can go to the UCS website and you can see what's being uh, offered in terms of uh, groups. Also, we responded to the community, not only by delivering um, equipment to those in need, but we also uh, set up United Counseling hub computers, if you will, where we put them in our partner agencies. And I do want to highlight, and I know uh, Alia did a beautiful job talking about our community part partnerships. We have worked so well with um, with Turning Point, with the hospital, um, with um, <laughs> I'm trying Summer to think of some of the other. Yes, absolutely. Hey. And I think economic services and Department of Corrections. I mean, we, there are so many talented people out there that want to work together to make this successful. And so okay. I. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to, you know, as we kind of um, talk about you know, traditionally UCS has also had a lot of work around substances too. And so we layer COVID and a pandemic on top of that. What are you, see, what are you both seeing in terms of more use or how do we take care of, of even that group 
that really needed a lot of the attention. And now we've got more people coming. Talk to me a little bit about, uh, you know, I think uh, many Bennington and Bennington County people are familiar with the the opioid and the rise in opioid use, uh, along yep. with uh, Dr. Reeve, you had mentioned, um, you know, child abuse and, and, and everything else. Uh, Laura, you mentioned PAVE. Um, all those systems kind of work together. What is COVID doing to those? Are they, are we having to put them aside or how are we dealing with all that? So we probably both have a lot to say about this because we are obviously dealing with a lot of this. So how I describe describe it is it's a epidemic within a pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. So we know there was a community um, needs assessment that was done. And we do know that Bennington County has the highest number of people using prescription um, drugs. And so that is a concern. So one of the things that we've done is Department of Health created harm reduction bags. Inside these bags are uh, is Narcan um, uh, fentanyl strips to test to make sure that we can keep people alive. The word is that they are being used and we have saved some lives. You know, at this point, we really need to meet people where they are. And if they are not able to sustain sobriety during a pandemic, that's understandable. But we want to keep them alive so they can until they can learn the skills to self-soothe without the medication. And that in fact is why um, the, the intensive BIOP was created. It started last week. There is room available for people that need that level of care. Uh, we have individual counseling as well for people that might not need that intensity and group uh, for substance use as well. So we, we understand that people are doing the best they can. And, you know, the American way is to self-medicate uh, by, by using mood altering substances. So this is a way to teach, upload uh, different kinds of strategies, meditation and yoga and, and, and exercise and different ways to be able to regulate that nervous system without having to use medication. Before I go over to Dr. Reeve, what's, uh, what's the phone number at UCS and what's the website people can go? How do people schedule an appointment with you? So we have same day access, same day you reach out, you'll you'll reach us and, and we'll get you in for an intake. The number is 802-442-5491. And you would go to the United Counseling, uh, I think it's ucsvt.org. Is that correct? I think so. Yep. Thank you. So uh, either the phone number, um, the website, uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, our walk-ups accessible, but I want to uh, go over to yep. uh, Dr. Reeve first. So all of those things are true. Okay. <laughs> um, but but so far we're not open on Saturdays and Sundays except for emergency services. Uh, but I say so far. Basically, one of the things that COVID has taught us, like everybody else, like all of our um, excellent restaurants in town, is that doing business differently doesn't mean shutting the doors. So we have screeners at every building. We do um, monitoring for health, for COVID symptoms. We also are ready to start staggering appointments, having people with the cold weather not have to be bunched up to come in. So especially where we expect more people, we're staggering the appointments. We're going to start the recognition and giving them a text message in the parking lot. People who come by public transportation, they're not going to sit on the bus or be left out in the cold. They're going to come in and be processed in the house so they can stay warm. We're not causing anybody to freeze. But maybe mm -hmm. we're going to start going into longer evening hours. Maybe we're going to be going into Saturday or Sunday hours as needed to keep everybody spread out and have access to services. So that's the kind of commitment to taking our resources, making them available as people need them. Okay, great. Um, we, we had talked a little bit about this. I think we had edged towards it, but I want to spend some time on uh, next week is Thanksgiving. Um, mm -hmm. The governor has put out a request to, I think, all Vermonters to not meet in small groups. We find that that is actually the way that this virus is spreading the most. It's not about people traveling to Vermont. It's not in restaurants. It's not in lodging properties. Uh, it is actually, very actually, much- put out a request to, to meet only in very small groups and in within the households, not- Within the, within not the household. meet with large groups. And, yeah. and one of the things that people struggle with is what does a household entail? And it's not always the physical uh, confinement. There are several people who 
Um, one of our staff, uh, she and her husband care for his mother and they live on the same property in two separate buildings. Is that two households? No, mm. that is one household. They are taking care of her seven days a week. They're having dinner with her seven days a week. No, on Thanksgiving, they don't say, no, we can't have dinner right. with you. And we're going to have it Friday too. On the other hand, another staff um, and his spouse, the, his father-in-law lives down the street and comes to their house three or four times a week. But they decided not to have the multi-generational Thanksgiving dinner because a number of the relatives, the siblings and cousins live out of state or far away and have five, seven people in their families. So they said, no, we're both in healthcare. We can't do that. And they were discussing, well, when should we do our local dinner, Thursday or Friday? And they th were leaning towards Friday. And the father-in-law piped in and said, oh, yeah, Friday's a lot better because everybody who was going to come to your house is coming to my house on Thursday. So then I'd be free to come to see you on Friday. And it was like, whoa, no, 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 no. You have just met with everybody that you will be bringing to us. So either they don't come see you if you want to see us, or if you're going to see them, you can't see us for two weeks. Yeah. Uh, and making so that conversation. And what it really comes down to is an open conversation with everybody. Where have you been? Who are you seeing? What precautions are you taking day in, day out? Who else has been in your vehicle? Where else have you stopped? What, are, what have you done when you go grocery shopping? How many new places did you go? How many state borders did you cross? How many <laughs> bars did you go right. to, et yeah. cetera? Well, so and I think, as, I think as Dr. Dobson had said even the last time, and maybe the easiest answer to that is we skipped this year and, and it is a sacrifice and it is, but you know, you, uh, Dr. Reeve, you list all of those things and, and I can imagine a lot of families aren't even going to remember that, let alone go through that. It, it, to some degree, this is the year we chalk up to, to COVID along with all the other things we've had to kind of lay down. Uh, this seems to be one of them. Laurie, you were going to say something before I butt in. No, I think that um, I, I heard something that really helped me kind of conceptualize that. And they said, imagine your bubble. So if your bubble is that you see your grandmother every day because she takes care of your little one, then, um, and you have another child at home, then that's your bubble, right? So that's okay. If that's who you're exposed to every day, that's a different story. But it's when you start inviting uh, cousin Joe from down the street and, and auntie of, in Massachusetts, though, that is when it starts to to be outside of the bubble. And those are the people that you zoom in. Like, let's have this be fun. Zoom them in, play some games, uh, you know, be playful and, and do loving things for them. The ones that can't be there, you know, um, you know, have a moment where you're uh, celebrating them and you're uh, talking about the things that you love about them and ways that they um, have always made the holiday fun for you. So it is different. Again, you can bring just as much fun and creativity in and at the same time, be keeping yourself safe. And we will get through this together by being smart like this. Yeah. What are some of the, so, you know, Absolutely, Lori. What are some of the emotions I might be feeling and, and are they okay? Uh, so, you know, Ooh. Dr. Reeve, you're always good at kind of highlighting like, hey, you might be feeling this and that's what you're supposed to feel. You know, yeah. we get it. So what are some things that, you know, we're not being able to see these family members, which remind everybody that usually we're complaining that we have to go see all these family members <laughs> the other year. Um, hey, but this year we can't. You get to what silence we, them now. I know. That may be one of Lori's positive notes is that, hey, this may be an opportunity to have a very nice, quiet Thanksgiving. Uh, Dr. Reeve, what, what are some things that we're going through emotionally? What, any, any American, any well, human being, what are we going through? Well, one of them is loss. One of them is sadness. Um, and one of them is just uncertainty, which is different from loss and sadness. And all of those can trigger anxiety. But when you are uncertain, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be anxious or angry or sad or lost or lonely, but you're just not absolutely sure about things. And that is sort of the baseline of COVID. And 
that is where you turn and you say to the Dr. Dobsons of the world, well, when will this be over? Well, we don't know. You know, yeah. you have to tolerate the don't know response. So how do you tolerate uncertainty? You can become anxious and rile up your stomach and raise your pulse and have shortness of breath, or you can do some techniques to settle those things down and realize you are not immediately under threat. Um, you can decide that you don't want to have turkey. It turns out you happen not to like turkey. And this is the time to have, I don't know, pineapple for Thanksgiving dinner. So terrific. Um, but there's an opportunity for choice. And when you turn the sense of being deprived into what is a choice, it become, it opens. And when you give yourself an opening, it gives you a chance to engage in some creativity. And what Lori is talking about, have some fun games. One of the things about Zoom, unless you get lots of people in and all the pictures get small, you tend to do what we're doing here, which is we tend to get the shoulder shots and we get pretty decent eye contact and we see pretty good views of facial expression most of the time. That matters to us affectively. That's the connection. So maybe you briefly do all of the people, but maybe you do sequentially with different groups. Mm -hmm. So you really can see what they're saying. You can really hear them and you can be heard because when you are heard, you matter. Yeah. And, and, and if you're a Zoom expert, you can even put people in the breakout room. So if you had all 30 cousins join, you can spread them out and then you can switch your breakout room. So the creative ways, right? There's a, I think Lori, getting back to what Lori said, there's, look, th this is the current situation. It's, it's the Stockdale paradox, right? It is the idea that, um, you know, we have to deal with the brutal facts that we currently know about and yet have unwavering faith that we will succeed in the end. And so the other thing how do is, we do that? This time of year, a lot of people start noticing with the shortening of days mm -hmm. with the holidays, that there are a lot of anniversaries, a lot of depression, a lot of seasonal affective disorder. One of the things is not to mix central nervous system depressants, which are the benzodiazepines and the alcohol and make your depression worse. One of those things is not to isolate from all social contact. Yes, it is to reduce, but many people who are feeling lonely or alone will put themselves in large groups in order not to have to connect to anybody. Um, so you can be very alone in a large group. You know, you can sit at the back of the church and not talk to anybody, literally. So it's important to allow yourself to actually connect. That's why I was talking about the affective recognition of being valued and validated by connecting to another person. And that's really important as a way to balance out the heaviness that depression creates in a person. It's a physical heaviness. It's a physical sensation of not being well. It's a difficulty in thinking. Pills help to some extent. They don't, they don't change the meaning. They don't change the meaning of loss. They don't change the meaning of anniversaries or religious celebrations. So you have to do the mental psychological work to engage in how to move forward. I, I so appreciate you bring that up, Dr. Reeve. I mean, again, we're not only layering in a COVID pandemic, but I think what is, and I've had this conversation with others before, I think what's always surprising is the way that we polish up the holidays, you know, <laughs> is they're the, they're the best part of the year, right? They're the most favorite part of the year. And yet they're the, they're the period that we miss our dads and our moms that have gone on, our friends that have passed away, or the people that just can't be with us right now, or, you know, we're in a, we're in a spat with a friend. And, you know, so in a way, the holidays are, are a very strong reminder of the people that are no longer with us. And, and so that alone creates the depression, some depression of, of the holidays, for sure. Right, right. Um, what are you going to say? Go ahead, Lori. 
Oh, golly. I just have loved listening, really. Um, I think the invitation for me is to see this time as bittersweet. Um, you know, it is true that we're going through a pandemic. However, um, this is there's so many things we're learning about ourselves, what really soothes our soul, you know, what kinds of things are important. Like for myself in the morning, I pray and meditate and then I try to run um, a 5K every day. Um, and so for me, that really lifts my spirits before I come into work. And I, and I will be honest with you, I called all of our community governments to say, hey, what are you doing? What are the special things that are happening in our community to help people through? I heard the loveliest stories, you know, maybe it's not singing from balconies, but it is, I, you know, there was a, a, a mail delivery person that if she wasn't seeing people collect their mail, she was knocking on their door. Uh, in Bennington, Bennington College students that were, that stayed behind, they were literally picking up shopping lists for, for people that were shut-ins and buying their grocery shop. Uh, their grocery items and dropping them back off. So there is such, so much beautiful um, things that are happening during this time. It's such a time of, of, of really being able to show our compassion and to be graceful and to show how we can love one another in a different way. And, and, and it's an opportunity for you to try things out, like try exercise, try coloring, you know, listening to different kinds of music. Um, you know, w one of the things that uh, my husband and I did is we did, we were task oriented. We decided to pull up all the rugs in our house and expose the wood floors. And then we had to deal with the glue and deal with the sanding, but it kept us focused. And actually, we have these gorgeous hardwood floors now, and that, and that wouldn't have happened. So, so think of a task that you can do that will keep you busy and, and distract yourself with things. Watch movies that you love, and maybe it's been a long time, and, or go back into reading like Harry Potter series or, or other things that feed your soul. And I, I just have to say that, and, and when the emotion comes, allow it, right? So the emotions are great, all of them. We seem to like, we seem to categorize emotions that are okay and, and those that are not okay. The truth is they're all okay. But the big, but the big message I wanna say is we are much more than our emotions. Mm. We are much more than what we feel. And that the ability to state change. So if we're having that heaviness, that feeling of heaviness, we can create distance. We can state change and we can do things that that alive in us. We can dance to the radio. We can we can do things, call someone that makes us laugh out loud. Don't take the call from someone that's a Debbie Downer. You know, start to do things that help you feel connected to positivity and hope and and optimism and 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 there and extend yourselves. So this is the invitation as well as this is a bittersweet time. Do something today for someone else. Pay it forward in the littlest ways, a little candy bar outside of somebody's door. It just means the world, you know, and, and I really invite people to just see this time as an opportunity for you to grow and knowing yourself and to extend that love you have inside to others. Yeah, I, uh, I just finished up the book, uh, Grit, I think uh, that was Grit by Duckworth. And, and, and what I love about how, what she writes about is practicing hope and practicing yeah. optimism. Um, for some people are just born, I guess, hopeful and optimistic, but I would argue that a majority of us have to practice it every single day, that it's, we all eventually have to deal with life and life can be hard sometimes. And so I always appreciated how she framed it. I mean, it wasn't just optimism and hope, it was practicing. It meant waking up every single day, choosing uh, to be hopeful and what are some of the techniques that you've uh, so perfectly outlined, Lori and, and Dr. Reeve. Um, I do want to remind people we are live on Facebook. Uh, thank you, Cat TV, for broadcasting. And if you have a question for Lori or Dr. Reeve, uh, we've got about 20 more minutes. And so uh, we'd love to see some um, great positive comments on the Facebook channel. And if you have a question for them, uh, please uh, uh, leave it there and we will try and get to it. Uh, uh, Lori, again, the phone number, if people are needing to get in touch with UCS, they're watching this, they're, they need to get in touch now. What's, what's the best phone number to reach out to? It's 802-442-5491. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you both of you. I want to take a, a slightly different direction. Um, it's still along the lines of maybe uh, holidays and even uh, maybe some uh, uh, substance abuse. I'm not a substance abuser, but I'm a, I'm a mother. I'm a father. I'm a brother. 
and I see it in other people. Um, where do I, where, where do I go with that? Where do I take that? How do I deal with that? Are, is there a kind of a, a UCS way of, <laughs> of either approaching that person uh, that I care about and, and, and feel for, or what's the best, what's the best uh, medicine for that? The first question is going to be to have a conversation. The first thing not to do is to pull out your labels and label that person as a black sheep and the problem for the family or the problem in your relationship. Like, you know what's wrong with you, Matt? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> that doesn't go really far. And the person who's being victimized is going to either get really defensive and shut down, or they're going to collude and say, yeah, I know I'm a failure and I'm terrible. And you're going to watch them physically sink in front of you like that. And you're defeating them and you. Part of in people who are chronically drinking, as opposed to drinking too much at one occasion, which every once in a while people, I mean, weddings are famous for people imbibing way too much, but we're talking about more chronic use and dealing with emotions is to do th several things. One of them is to realize that there are three parties. It's that person, yourself, and the substance that has had a biological impact on that person now that is having a cellular conversation with them. So the words are not connecting to the person in the same way. And that's part of what we don't recognize. In the same way um, that when we deal with people who have a developmental disability that involves communication problems or after stroke or after brain injury or people with severe autism spectrum disorder, we have to adapt our conversations in order to be able to be heard. So having the conversation with this person at the time that they are intoxicated is not going to go very far because they may or may not remember that you cared about them they will not remember the content because they were intoxicated. And you go forward thinking, wow, we really cleared the air. And they go forward saying, well, we hung out last night. That's really different. Now, the other thing, and Lori will talk a lot about motivational interviewing, I'm sure, as well as other resources, but you want to ask the person, you want to encourage the person to their place of being willing to change. So sometimes it's recognizing a problem. Sometimes it is feeling that you are on their side, combating it together. Um, if they don't, if they really and truly don't think there's a problem and it is insurmountable for you, you don't have communication. And so you have to find a place to begin to establish communication. And one of the things that we end up with our psychiatric training is practicing being able to form alliance and communication with people. So that's where our emergency clinicians are brought in by police or emergency responders to help diffuse a situation. It's not that they're magicians, it's that they are very practiced at establishing communication with people who are in duress and then moving forward to the next step. So Lori, do you wanna give him some more of the repertoire of supports? Sure, I mean, my first thought is that uh, radical acceptance, you know, it's not our business to change other people. Um, and we really can't change other people, right? So what we can do is be this loving kindness and practice healthy skills ourselves, so that we are, we're a light that people are drawn to and they want more from us and they want to learn more. And I love the idea of what Alia is saying where, you know, judgment never helps any, all it does is separate us and it, and it, and it hurts. And so, you know, 
you know, you can offer to do things like go for a walk or do an activity that would make it harder for them to use in that moment. So there are things you can do where they can start to experience resources that are actually good for them instead of trying to, you know, teach them or preach to them. And, you know, so it can be meditation, it can be uh, exercise, uh, moving their bodies, yoga, whatever relaxation or mind mindfulness. And, but, but if they're impaired in the moment, you, you, it's all about you being genuine and authentic to yourself. You know, it's, there's something called detached with love. And that means that you, you see it happening. You have to take care of yourself. And, and then when the opportunity presents itself and they're, they're not impaired in the moment, then you can share how you're feeling your, you know, and that you would like to be able to experience them. You're worried uh, about them and experience them without being uh, chemically impaired. So I think though, um, for the holiday, probably all of us have someone in our, in our families that we worry about that they overindulge in the substances. And I think um, it's just creating opportunities where the, the substance wouldn't be there. And, and separate from that, I really think that you just have to live your best life and, and watch and see what happens. I think people are drawn to that example. And one of the things you can do that families often don't consciously address is if you know that there's somebody who has a tough time and you ask them what would be helpful for them and they say no alcohol or limited sweets because they have diabetes, for example. So alcohol and heroin are not the only problems. Sugar is a big problem. Um, Then let's make an agreement. Uh, you know, if, if, if somebody wants to say, I really don't want to stop everybody, then we say, okay, we are having no more than one glass of something for everybody. And everybody is going to have this one glass and that's it. And we're not going to have anything more accessible to anybody. We're going to share being together. And you're not alone in the changes you are trying to make. Great. Um, kind of wrapping up, I have two final questions. And again, I'll offer to our audience, if you're, if you're watching with us on Facebook, um, you know, leave a comment, we'll try and get to it, but uh, we don't see a whole lot of comments coming through at the moment. Um, It's January one, New Year's day. It's a new year and we're still somewhat inside. What does the future look like to both of you? How do we deal with uh, the new year and, uh, and, and, a, and a winter, a Vermont winter that will eventually become a Vermont spring. Um, mm-hmm. what, what does that look like to both of you? Go ahead, Laura. I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, what are those unique human qualities that you want to bring forward, right? This is an opportunity, right? It is, there's a new normal. We are living a new normal. And so I have to tell you, I get out every morning and run and I'm the only person out there. So there are times of the day where you are not going to have to, um, wear a mask that you're going to be safe out there. And so figure out for you, what is that going to look like? What are the, you, what are the unique qualities you want to bring forward? This is the year to think about that. What do you want to learn online? Do you want to learn French? Do you want to get your degree in something like this gets to be an opportunity that bittersweet again, right? The silver lining. What is it that you want to bring forward in your own life? Connecting more with your child, right? Learning more, ha- learn something together. So, and the same is true for couples, you you know, uh, this is really a time that, you know, we don't often think about taking a pause. The American way is to just be on high and keep going. Right. And so this is an opportunity. It's, it's a it's a time for you to bring more compassion inward and see what happens in the new year with that. Great. Thank you, Lori. Now, one of the secrets to Lori's running is she's actually physically at work by 730. So when she's talking about the morning, she's talking 530. And not everybody is. It's been getting cold at 530. I had my shorts on yesterday. Brave, brave. Dr. Reeve, what does the new year look like for you? Well, one of the things about New Year's is it's an artificial beginning. Um, There's really nothing different in the new year from this morning, which is every day is a beginning and every minute is new. 
So one of the things one has to remind oneself is that every time you feel like you have slipped up, failed, got stuck in a rut, you have this moment, another opportunity for another choice. And January 1st will be another opportunity. And as you say already, we're going to be looking towards a Vermont spring. Yes, any virus we have is going to be less prevalent by the time we get warmer weather and we're more outdoors. Mm -hmm. We should be having a significant amount of vaccine available and we'll be dealing with a lot of people's concerns about taking a vaccine that has not had a two year proving period, but a rapid proving period. And there will be some uncertainty, but one of the most important things we can do for each other is gonna become vaccinated as it's possible. And we'll start with the high risk groups and the first responders, and then we'll go through tiers. And the state of Vermont has done a beautiful job of planning out what the phases are. Um, it will, it'll take time. And we are talking about the psychological, physical and emotional choices and responses we have that can endure for time. And so none of the things that we've talked about today are things you do once and they're done. They're all habits. You talked about the optimism habit. Um, if you're stubborn, that's a real asset in a time like this because by golly, you're gonna stick to doing mm -hmm. some things and no one's gonna stop you from going forward. And, and that's what we need, is we need to keep moving forward and we, keep, and we need to keep thinking, what are we trying to accomplish? Is it, are we trying to do things, everything the same, or are we trying to make sure we get such and such done? So whether it's UCS providing services to people, and we're using more telehealth and we're using different kinds of groups and we're distancing out physically, but are we meeting the emotional needs and supporting the necessary changes? It's how learning is going forward. It's how early childhood interventions are happening. And we noticed all summer long that lunches continued in order to increase food security to households and to kids. That's what I mean about finding ways to address what needs to be addressed rather than, well, we haven't done it that way before. Yeah. That's the last thing that, mm -hmm. that should be the stepping off point. We haven't done it that way before. So what's the new play going to be? It's like portaging in the wilderness. Okay, there's rapids, but how do we find the, the water that we're going to continue to canoe on? Yeah. And that's what the invitation January 1st is. Yeah. How are we going to get through? How much snow are we going to shovel? Is it going to be a cold winter, a high snow winter, or a really dry winter? And, and time will tell. And I think, but Dr. Okay. Reed, I don't a, know. You don't know. And I don't know. Uh, even though every now and then at the chamber, we do get a call. When, uh, when is the exact moment that peak foliage is happening? And <laughs> We always have to put our finger in the air and go, um, I want to thank both of you. On October <laughs> we, 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 get, we get a little wise on the phone every now and then. Um, I want to thank both of you so much for taking time mm -hmm. out of your busy day. You guys are frontline warriors, as we've said that with the hospital as well. You guys are, are dealing with this pandemic, um, not just physically, um, but, but perhaps even more importantly, emotionally for many of us in dealing on the front line. So I wanna thank you and to thank uh, the staff at UCS for all the hard work you guys have been doing for a long, long uh, year. Um, but, but I do, I think we all agree on the call that there are, are brighter days ahead and uh, we look forward to, uh, to seeing you at those days as well. I wanna thank Lori Vatican and Dr. Alia Reeve for joining us here on the telecast. Thank you everybody uh, for tuning in and thank you Cat TV uh, as always for letting us broadcast live on your channel. Thank you, everybody, and have we a great weekend. We are lucky end. to have Cat TV. Thank we you, Anne, very thank much. Thank you. Thank you.